Matthew chapter 4. So in Matthew chapter 4, it says here in verse 12, Now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came by and dwelt in Capernaum. Now, if you have a pen, circle the word Capernaum. I'm coming back to that word. Okay. So Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Nephtali, and that it may be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Nephtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, right? And upon those who sat in the region of the shadow of death, light has dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to uh, uh, preach and to say, what? Repent, what? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand or is near, however your version says it, right? Okay, so the kingdom of heaven's at hand. But going way back to that city of Capernaum. Now, Jesus ministered to a lot of people from Capernaum. Uh, he, he ministered to Peter. Andrew, his brother, was from there. James, John, uh, and even Matthew were from there. But interesting enough, if next to that word in your Bible, I want you to write this down. The word Capernaum means this, the village of comfort. The village of comfort. That's what it means. The village or the city or the town of comfort. And so the Lord Jesus goes to it. Now you talk about revival. Jesus goes to a town called the village of comfort and calls them out. Is that right? In the day and the age where everything is about your comfort. I call it the powdered pews of America. All right? So and, and everything is about you. It's all about me. You know, everyone sings, right? And so it's all about me, right? And so everything is for you. Is it too hot? Is it too cold? Is it too loud? Is it too, you know, whatever. It's all about you. It's about your comfort, right? But here Jesus called people out of the land of comfort. Look at your neighbor say, get out of comfort. So Jesus called them out of comfort, and he told them to repent. In other words, to turn your direction and to realize the kingdom of heaven has come near. In other words, the kingdom is present. You have to make a decision. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen, but that's okay. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers. Now, here we go. Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother. Where was he? In the land of the village of comfort. And he saw these two brothers, Simon called Peter, Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, what? Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Ah, So immediately, right in the call to the kingdom, there was a, a charge. It wasn't about, you know, I mean, you talk about a salesman. Now, both Susie's and are my dad, my dad and Susie's dad was a car salesman for a while. Can you imagine a car salesman like this? This is a terrible car salesman, right? If you're a car salesman, you know, God forgive you. No, I'm just kidding. I'm okay. I'm just, I'm just teasing you. Okay. But if you're in car sales, you would never sell a car like this. You would never say the car can't do this. The car can't do that. <laughs> Come on, talk to me, right? You talk about everything it can do, right? Is that right? Is that right, George? I mean, you just talk about every, this, man, this thing will spin on a top and it'll pay your taxes and everything. Right? It'll do all those different things that you want it to do, right? This is an amazing car, right? And Jesus doesn't come selling it. In fact, all he does is say, repent, turn. There's an opportunity for you to leave comfort. And I'm going to train you to be fishers of men. Just like Pastor Bill was talking about tomorrow morning, right? So he says, listen, I'm going to train you to do something. I'm not going to train you to hear something. I'm going to train you to do something. Right? So then he goes on to say this, and they immediately left their nets. So in other words, they left their retirement. They left their 401K. They left their IR. Come on, somebody, right? They left all of it. They left all of it behind, everything they were going to inherit from, from Zebedee, their father, the, everything they were going to inherit, and they left it all for a preacher that's never been on TBN. 
Never been on, never been in Charisma magazine. Who is this guy? I don't even, I've never read a book of his. I've never even, come on, talk to me here, right? And, uh, you know, I mean, in, in all of the things that we used to pre-qualify and, and to elevate somebody's status and stuff, Jesus had none of those. You know, it makes you kind of wonder if there were other people that he called but didn't answer the call. Right? Catherine Kuhlman said this before she died many times. So did Billy Graham. I was never God's first choice. They both said that. Catherine Kuhlman said, I was never God's first choice. God went to many other men, and they said no. I was just dumb enough to say yes. <laughs> Billy Graham said the same thing. He said, the Lord told me, you weren't my first choice. I went to many others before you, but they all said no. Come on, right? So sometimes it's not to the smartest or to the fastest or to the, come on, right? It's to the one that's willing to leave comfort. So what is revival about? It's about leaving your comfort. It's about you getting out of your comfort zone, right? So, it's, so here it is about them leaving comfort. And so going on from there, he saw two other brothers. Ah, James, the son of Zebedee, John, their brother. In the boat was Zebedee, their father. They were mending their nets, and he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. They left comfort. They left the village of comfort, right? And Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all Syria, and then... What happened? These guys, what did they do? They brought unto him all the sick people and those that were afflicted with various diseases and torments and those that were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. And great multitudes followed him from Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and even beyond the Jordan. Is that right? So here, as they left the place of comfort, they were leaving this place of comfort, you know. And, and so here Jesus is calling them out of comfort. And as they left comfort, they saw the kingdom de demonstrated. There's something about seeing the kingdom demonstrated. And when, when all of a sudden that takes place, it, there's, a, there's something that happens. And, and I can't go into great detail here tonight, but... Um, but several years ago, we were ministering here in the Twin Cities when we used to live in Florida, about five years ago, six years ago. And so we're ministering over in Burnsville. And so as we're ministering in Burnsville in this church, uh, the one night um, uh, we, we had some people that came to the service. And as they came to the service, um, <laughs> Susie and I went to go pray for somebody. And as we went to go pray for this young lady... Uh, we went and we just stretched our hand out and the power of God slain this, this girl in the spirit and she screamed at the top of her lungs and demons were coming out of her. And the visitors that we invited got up and left. And they're family members of ours and they never came back to church to one of our meetings. They won't come back. That was like six years ago. Is that right, babe? Something like that, six years ago and they've never come back. What happened? The kingdom was demonstrated. And the price was too high. I said the price was too high. See, some people, the price is too high. The, the price of Jesus, the price of revival is too high. It's, it's not all about gold dust and falling down and getting, you know, and, you know, and laughter. And I, we, we believe in all of those different things. But listen, it's, it's way beyond that. There's also a cost to it. There's also a cost to revival. There's a cost to the kingdom. There's a cost to following Jesus. Come on, right? And I love it that Jesus doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't water it down. He just says, this is the cost. Take it or leave it. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> this is the only way in. Amen? He doesn't try and make it palatable. He doesn't try to make it comfortable. He says, listen, leave your comfort and come follow me. What will we do? I don't know. We'll know tomorrow. What we're doing tomorrow. Is that right? And, and, and there's something about living life with Jesus like that. Look over in uh, here in the book of uh, Matthew, but go over to chapter 10. 
chapter 10. So Matthew chapter 10 says it like this, verse 34. Do not think that I came, verse 34, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a, a sword. Now I've said it before, but a sword, you don't use a sword to butter bread with. Okay, so you, a sword is a killing device, right? So here, he said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Woo, I bet you he sold a lot of tapes that day. Well, great sermon. He who loves father or mother more than me is not even worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake finds it. Is that right? Is that what it says? Amen. And now this is too high of a price for most. Most churches, most churches you go into, whether here in Minnesota or any, any other place that you go, it's just too high of a price. It's just overwhelming when it can be so much coddling. And, you know, uh, one guy said, you know, oh, well, let me just say it like this. Billy Graham said it like this. That if you took the Holy Spirit out of most churches, they would continue doing everything they've been doing up to about 90% of what they've been doing with no problem without the Holy Spirit even be present. They wouldn't even know that he was gone. That's a dangerous place. I said, that's a dangerous place. Is that right? But here Jesus says, man, I'm going to set this one against this one. And man, for years that bugged me, that verse bugged me, you know. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit said this to me. It wasn't about the relationships. It was about the distractions. It was about the voice and the distractions. It had nothing to do with the relative, uh, you understand? It's not about the relative, it's about the distraction. And those that were getting saved were finding relatives that were not coming into the kingdom, and they would distract them. And so Jesus is using that as an analogy. Now, I can say this perfectly tonight. This is, my, this is the story of my life. My wife will tell you this is the story of my life. I got saved, okay, Lord help me now, 39 years ago. Western Minnesota, little dinky town called Morris. All right? So I get saved in Morris, Minnesota as a teenager. These kids get me saved, and I was on fire for Jesus. I mean, right from the get-go. The night I got saved, I felt the power of God touch my whole body. And I went home, and I ripped all the wicked pictures off my walls and stuff, I, I mean, I just, everything that was of the world, I wanted to separate. I mean, I was busting up albums and all kinds of stuff to separate from that voice. Amen? And I, and I went and got, you know, my Lutheran Bible that my family had given me. You know, it was, it was a little watered down, but it, it worked temporarily, understand? So, and so then I went out and I saved up my allowance and I went and I bought a, uh, a NASB. <laughs> And I began to read that thing cover to cover. And I'd weep and I'd cry. And I had these worship albums and I'd weep in God's presence. Shut the lights off so no one could see me as a teenager. And I'd just cry and cry. And God was touching me. And the Lord began to put within me. And the Lord would give me scriptures like this scripture. And there's another scripture over in, uh, I think it's Timothy. It says, no one stood with me, but the Lord stood with me. And the Lord gave me scriptures like that. And in less than 30 days, my family changed their mind and said, you can no longer go to Bible study. You cannot go to that church anymore. You cannot associate at all. And that night, I mean, that night, I mean, literally 30 days, I was a baby, baby Christian. And I had to, I had to get hungry. Everyone say get hungry. Man, I had to get so hungry for God. I had, I, I had to, in fact, my family didn't even want me reading the Bible. So my mother told me, you can't read the Bible in the house anymore. So I had to get up at 4 a.m. before she would get up so I could read the Bible. And then I'd go back to bed before I got up for school. Right here in the state of Minnesota. So I grew up underneath that. And so there was a, a, a tenacity in my spirit from the beginning. 
And so that's why when I went into the full-time ministry, I'll, I'll be honest with you. When I went to Bible school, I didn't even know what, I didn't even know, George, I didn't even know what hypocrisy was. I, I blew my mind. I mean, I, I went to Bible school downtown Minneapolis. I was in my first year of Bible school, and I saw people partying and sleeping around and stuff. And I'm like, what in the world is this? You guys need to get dunked again, or I'll cast the devil out of you, one of the two. And, and, and I found this tenacity that God had built on the inside of me it, to the point where, uh, you know, Dr. How, how many of you know who Dr. David Nichols is? I mean, he'll tell you. Dr. Nichols will tell you. I would stand up in class and say, nope, that's unbiblical. The word of God does not say that. You cannot say that, brother. He'll tell you right now. He'll tell you that's exactly how I was when I was 19 years old because I was so full of the word that I would even challenge the instructors <laughs> I mean, they probably had a party when I finally left, you know, and went into the ministry. And I, I started working with drug addicts and alcoholics when I was just barely turned 20 years old. And, and I had to teach, and, and, and they told me, they said, you got to teach the word four hours a day. No problem. I, can, I said, I can do 10. <laughs> and I had to teach the word to these drug addicts and alcoholics for four hours a day. They said, you got to work 20 hours a day, nonstop. You get to sleep four hours a day. I said, wonderful. They said, the pay is 600 a week. I said, perfect. And I just was in love because I went and I was given everything I had. Come on, somebody. I counted the cost. I laid it. I mean, I burned my bridges behind me. <laughs> Come on, right? I mean, uh, I forget his name. Um, oh, man. What was the name of the Spanish, uh, the Spaniard who discovered South America, Cortez? No, 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 Hernan Cortez or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And so he went, and when they landed, and they landed on the shore, the, he waited for everyone to get off the ships, and he burned the ships. And they said, what are you doing? He said, oh, you're motivated now to take this. <laughs> there's nowhere to go back to. <laughs> now you're motivated because there's no going back. Come on, somebody. You know, I think that sometimes in the kingdom of God, there's too many plan Bs. What if there was no plan B? I said, what if there was no plan B? I said, what if there was no plan B? I, what, what if there was no vaccine ever? What if there wasn't? And all you had was the Holy Ghost and believe in God's word. Come on. So, I, I'm not saying that there isn't, but I mean, what if there wasn't? I'm just, I'm telling you what, I believe that God wants to put a Holy Ghost tenacity in the church, that the, that the ships are on fire, there's nowhere for us to go back. Come on. That revival is our destination, Minnesota. Come on, somebody. And I'm telling you, there's no other alternative. And I'll tell you what, I, I believe that, if, that God is looking to raise up of people like that. I remember when I first got saved, I went in, and um, uh, I was going to Bible school, and someone did the dangerous thing of bringing me to, now this is going to really date me. How many of you remember Jesus People USA downtown Minneapolis? Anyone? Okay, look at the hands go up. Remember that, Elaine? They were, ra they were radicals. Oh, my goodness. They made me look like, uh, you know, a, a pansy or something. I'm telling you what, these guys... They were radical Holy Ghost guys that got saved out of drugs and alcoholism and stuff. And there was a little revival on Hennepin Avenue. <laughs> I mean, the police didn't even need the police down there. I mean, the Holy Ghost guys were laying hands on everybody. From, remember that from Jesus People Church? You remember that? Did you go down there, Trish, as well? Did you? Yeah. It was a wild place, man. That's where I saw Carmen down there. So... But I'm telling you what, that's what I believe God is raising up. So now go with me over to the book of Luke. Go to Luke chapter 9. Woo, time is flying. So Luke chapter 9, hallelujah. Luke chapter 9. What lives in that comfort zone? What lives in it? You could throw that graphic up, brother, if you're ready. What lives in the comfort zone? Fear lives in the comfort zone. 
Fear lives in Capernaum. What else lives in Capernaum? Depression. Mediocrity. Weariness and tiredness all the time. That's what lives in the comfort zone. That's what lives in the realm of the comfort zone, the boat of unbelief. You know, everybody made fun of Peter when he sank, but at least he got out of the boat. There's 11 knuckleheads that were wet from the rain anyway. What difference did it make if you got wet in the water or you got wet in the boat? <laughs> at least Peter walked on water, amen? So, so what, lives, what lives in that comfort zone? I'll tell you what it is. It's that fear, depression, mediocrity, tiredness, and weariness. Here in the book of Luke chapter 9, it says this. At verse 57, now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to one another, follow me. And he said, Lord, first let me go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury the dead. You think I'm preaching rough. Holy cow. Let the dead take care of the dead. You need to go and preach the kingdom of God. Is that right? Woo. And another said, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me first go and let me bid farewell to all that are at my house. And Jesus said, no one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Is that what it says in the red part of your Bible? Wow. Who is that talking there? That's Jesus there's no one. You know, like, I, I like to brag on, on, on my wife. You know, like when God touched her in 1998 with the revival down there in, in Missouri. Now, my mother and father-in-law are here. They'll tell you the same story. My wife had a good job here. She had a, she had a job here in the city and everything else. But the Holy Ghost touched her in, in Missouri in a little town called Smithton where there was no gas station. There was, no, there was nothing down there. They didn't even have a lemonade stand in the town. It wasn't even on most maps. That's how small the town was. They had one stop sign they put up because of the revival. <laughs> it was a town of 532 people that would swell up to 2,800 on a weekend. And it would flood the, <laughs> what do you call it, the sewer system. <laughs> would flood on the weekends because they weren't built for 2,800 visitors and stuff like that. Come on, is that awesome, huh? But so my wife went down there, and the Lord really radically touched her. And when the Lord touched her like that with his fire and his presence, she came home, and she's like, I'm going. I'm moving. She's, you know, you know and, and so Susie said, I don't care what I got to do. I don't care where I got to live. I don't care what I got to eat. I've got to be down there in that presence. Is that right? Amen. And so that, that's, that's, the, that's such an awesome story of the kingdom, right? You know, and I scratch this down. I think it's real interesting that the Bible talks about the word Christian. Now, we use the word Christian a lot. But do you know that your Bible only mentions the word Christian twice? And the word disciple 200 times? Now, think about it this way. You have people today that say, well, Pastor Bill, I'm a Christian, but in my own way. Well... First of all, the two times the word Christian is mentioned, it was mentioned by an unbeliever. Believers never called each other Christians. They called each other believers and disciples. That's all they ever called them. Or they called themselves what they called the way. That's what the early church was called, the way. Okay. But uh, so as, as they called, that's why when you go through the book of, of Acts, it says that they went, the way went, because so, they called themselves the way. So they were disciples. They were Believer. But if you think about it like this, to be a disciple means you got to be following somebody. <laughs> Is that right? So you can't say, I'm a disciple, but in my own way. No, 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 no. Then you're no longer a disciple. Now you're not following anybody. Now you're back in Capernaum in the village of comfort. <laughs> if that's what you are, right? Amen. And so that's where the Lord is calling us into revival. revival. Revival is not just about the fallen down. Praise the Lord for the fallen down. You know, praise the Lord. We were talking to a pastor friend of ours. That, that's how we met Paul some 20 years ago. Was through Pastor Rodney Howard Brown. And Pastor Rodney Howard Brown, he's the one who's, who basically started the Toronto Blessing, the Pensacola outpouring, and all of these different revivals of the 90s. 
and, and, and many other ones as well. And he was telling of a story of he had gone to this big church and they had been there for six weeks of revival meetings and God just touched the place. And as soon as he left, the pastor went and had 16 families came to him, 16 couples came to him that were the head of parts of the ministry. And they said, we want you to marry us. He said, well, you are married. And they're like, no, we've been just living together in sin. But we were never convicted before the revival. <laughs> when the presence of God fell upon us in the revival meetings, we had to change. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, it's time for change. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. It's time for change. Amen. Time to come out of comfort. Come, time for change. Praise the Lord. I mean, you think of, you know, in 1904, there was a powerful revival hit Wales. They call it, some call it the greatest revival ever. In 13 months, the whole country was saved. And it was a revival of worship and prayer. That's what it was. And led by a, a young man, a 24-year-old young man, uh, by the name of Evans Roberts. And Evans Roberts was greatly used of God, and he, he had this revival bust forth. But they had certain earmarks. There were four different earmarks of the revival, and I forget the, all of them now. Get our book out there. It's got all four in there. I forget what they are. But anyways, one of them was public confession of sin. Woo! <laughs> and people would get up, and the power of God would hit the place as people would begin to repent publicly and others would be convicted and would come running to the altar. Every bar shut down in the country. Every policeman and every judge was laid off because there was no crime. No crime within 13 months. And so that's why we called it the fire that jumped the ocean. Because that fire jumped over here to a place called Azusa Street in 1906, in April of 1906. But it actually, uh, uh, Evans Roberts' revival over there in, in, you know, in Wales was just an amazing revival that still to this day, the, the, that it still affected the culture of Great Britain and people's lives and all kinds of different people were impacted. And uh, uh, even um, the Hebrides revival was a spinoff of that revival, I think, in the 1920s. And if you know of the Hebrides revival off the island of Scotland there and stuff and so uh, it's an island off of Scotland. But all of these revivals took place, and all of them had where they would turn from sin. I'll tell you what. That's what I believe the Lord is calling the church back to again. Coming away from sin. Coming back away from a sinful life. And coming back to righteousness. I said, let righteousness rule. Amen. Let righteousness rule. Let righteousness rule in the pews. Let righteousness rule in the pulpits. Let righteousness rule in the streets again. Hallelujah. Amen. More than ever before, we've got, you know, children that are, are, are fatherless. Many of the fathers have gone off and whatever, you know. And, 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 and you know, and, and some of that is, is as a result of it. Some of the sins of the fathers have been passed on down to the children, I better just keep moving along here. All right. So, uh, but, so what is the theology? The, the Lord began to speak to me this afternoon about this. What's the theology of the, the, the valley of comfort or the, this village of comfort? Number one, flesh loves the valley of comfort. Flesh loves it. Flesh loves it. Because number two, it's all about you and it's all about your comfort. In fact, we've even in Christianity in America, we have created doctrine. There's even churches that teach doctrine. If you're not comfortable, then it's not God. <laughs> or if it's not easy, then it's not God. Where is that in the book? That is nowhere in the Gospels or the book of Acts. Nowhere is your comfort as a part of it. Come on, somebody. Amen. In fact, it's about, there's something about getting out of your comfort. <laughs> Hallelujah. I remember when the Lord touched me in, in, in a church. We had a revival right here in the Twin Cities. 
in 1998. And I went there as a guest minister and I shared the story with you and the Lord just wrecked me. And for four days I was weeping under God's presence. I couldn't stop weeping for four days. I walked in the Mall of America crying like a little schoolgirl. I just couldn't stop. I mean, I shook under the power of, I, I was just, I thought something was, I didn't know what was wrong with me. It was God's presence touching me. It was like the Lord was just melting any Pharisee that was left in me. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Amen. And I was just like, I just felt it leaving me. And all of that religion and all of that stuff was going out of me. Come on, give Jesus a hand. Amen. In Roseville. In that Roseville revival, man, right off of Hamlin Avenue. I can still tell you right where the church was. Man, that was awesome. And God's presence was moving there, and lives were changed, and people were thrust into the ministry, and marriages were saved, and all kinds of stuff. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I said glory to God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. There's something about it that getting out of comfort. Hallelujah. So praise God. So get out of comfort. You know, sometimes comfort, you know, can be your greatest enemy. Well, just elbow your neighbor say he's talking about you. All right. So number three. Ooh, this is going to be a heavy one. Are you ready for this one? Number three. Entertainment is very important in the village of comfort. Entertainment is absolute. I'll tell you what. We have got so much entertainment. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year in our country. It's like we, we literally are worse than any drug addict with entertainment. We have a TV in every room of the house. We have a radio in every other room of the house, including our car, because <laughs> we can't do without entertainment. And I didn't even think about it till one day in 1998, after the Lord touched me with his fire like that, the Lord said that to me. He said, you're addicted to entertainment. I said, what? I'm not addicted to entertainment. He said, go without it then. One month. I mean, I was like, you know, I, I felt like, a, like going through withdrawals. I mean, I was reaching for the remote and all of this. Uh, you get in the car, what's the first thing you do? Oh, it's quiet in the First Presbyterian Church here tonight. Did you all go home and leave your carcass sitting there or something or what? Come on, somebody, right? So entertainment is absolutely the most important. Our entertainment being entertained, right? Number four, the fourth thing that's in the, in the village of comfort is to accumulate as much stuff and coddle all your fears that you can. That's what lives in the valley of comfort is coddling your fears, feeding your fears and everything. That's why Jesus calls us out of our fears. I said Jesus calls us out of our fears. Amen. He doesn't say, do you have this gift? Peter, James, do you guys have this gift? Okay, now you can go ahead because I wouldn't want it to be hard on you. I want it to be very, is this okay here? Is the sun okay right here? Is this all right? Can we stay here for the night? Is that all right? Can we sing this song? Is, is holy, holy, holy okay in heaven? Is that all right for you? Come on, somebody. Right? The valley of comfort, right? Or the village of comfort. But the theology of the kingdom is this. Number one, die to yourself. If you're offended, it means you aren't dead. Because you can't offend a dead man. I said you can't offend a dead man. You can, uh, you can call a dead person anything you want. You can say it to their face. You can say it about their family. You can say it about whatever, and they can't be offended. Why? Because they're dead. <laughs> Come on, right? And so that's one of the first things that Paul told the church at Ephesus. You are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So look at your neighbor and say, you're dead. <laughs> Okay, so the moment you got saved, Jesus didn't, he, Jesus wasn't an additive. Okay, I, I'm not a coffee drinker, okay, so pray for me, I know. My grandfather says, how can you be a good Norwegian and not like coffee? But, so, but 
I'm told that many of you like flavored drinks in your coffee. Come on, raise your hand. Right? So you like things added, right? But Jesus is not adding things. He's saying this, is there's a death, death to the old you, and a new life will arise. That's what baptism is about. Baptism is not just a symbol. It's a literal death. Your death, you are, Tom went down in the waters of baptism in Fargo, North Dakota in January of 19, or whatever it was, September of 1984. In Fargo, North Dakota, in the waters of First Assembly of God Church. Wow! I was dead and I rose to new life, according to Romans chapter 6. Come on, right? And that's how the early church functioned. I'm telling you, that's what I believe that the Lord is calling us. Amen. Uh, number two, stop living for yourself and your comforts. W will you help me, Paul? And get your guitar guy with you. Okay. So we have to stop living for ourselves. Start to live outwardly. Live outwardly. Live, live for others. I started to tell about when Susie went and relocated down there to, to the revival, you know, and, and, and I figured it up one day. She was working 40-some hours a week in her secular job to go serve in the revival meetings and she went to seven and a half years of revival meetings and missed two, uh, excuse me, missed one service when her grandmother died. And so what that said to me was it was so important she didn't want to miss. Are you with me? Amen. So it's not about your comfort. It's not all about you. Number three, there's no true joy outside the mountain of the kingdom of God. There's no joy outside the kingdom. You might find happiness, but there's no joy. Happiness is an external thing. Joy is an inward thing. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Happiness happens because good things happen around you. But the joy of the Lord can fill you in the midst of the hardest thing going on in your life. Come on, right? Number five. Your greatest goals is not stuff, but the kingdom advancement. And number six, faith only grows when we focus on his kingdom. That's where faith grows. Faith doesn't grow any other way. Faith grows. Your faith grows as you focus on the kingdom. In 1979, there was a revival that hit Southern California, Los Angeles. And actually in a city called Anaheim. And this revival that started in John Wimber's church, it started with primarily teenagers and young adults. And it exploded, and they found themselves baptizing people, and it was just crazy. And a church of 200 went from 200, and 13 months later, there were 5,800 in, in 13 months. In every single service, the blind were seeing, the deaf were hearing, and the lame were walking, and people were being raised from the dead. In every service, the Holy Spirit was hitting and delivering people of drugs and addictions of all sorts for 13 months. And I think about that, and I think to myself, Lord, do it here in the cities again. Do it here in the cities again. We've had it here before, but do it again, Lord. Do it again right here in the Twin Cities. Do it, do it with us. You know, I wonder if how many times the Lord knocks on churches saying, will you? What if people get offended? That's hard on a preacher. I said, that's hard on preachers. <laughs> I know I is one. We've had people walk out. But I've, I've learned in revival that sometimes you have to, you have to shake the tree. I said, sometimes you got to shake the tree. We've had people walk out and give us the middle finger, walk out of our services. Huh? Then we had revival break out. It was awesome. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Take your demons with you. Bye-bye. Come on, right? You know? And so, but that's, that's part of the cost of the kingdom. And I was just, I was meditating about, Lord, which way do we go here tonight? And I, I was wanting to do something, and I just felt like the Lord gave me this message about the village of comfort. 
out of that, the Lord began to remind me of those days when I was a little boy, or I was a teenager, and I would lay in my bed late in the night, one, two in the morning, tears running down my face as I had to have it on very quietly so my parents couldn't hear. As I would get up and set my alarm for, for 4 a.m. to read the Bible, to read God's Word. I had no pastor like this. I had no cell group leader. I had no mentor. Just me and the Holy Ghost. That was it. That was it. That was all I could. I mean, honest to God, that's my true story. That's, my wife will tell you that's a true story. My family to this day still. I mean, we prayed for my dad for uh, I don't know how many years to get saved. God finally shook the devil out of him, and he got saved. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Whew. That was awesome. But I, I, I just remember always, always, always resist. It was like from the time I got saved, then when I went to Bible school, I'm like, God, I thought I would go to Bible school, and I would just be, you know, easy. And, and here I'm with some lukewarm people. What in the world is this? And then I went in the ministry, and then I found even some more lukewarm people. And I'm like, what's the matter with you guys? I said, what's the matter? This, the kingdom is better than the world. The kingdom is better than comfort. Come on, somebody. And, I mean, you know, and then the Lord touched me, you know, after being a pastor for seven and a half years. And the Lord touched me with revival. I've, I've said it here before, but I'll say it again. I felt more like a fireman when I was a pastor, to put the fire out all the time. Turn it up, turn it down, make it hotter, make it colder, make it louder, make it shorter, make it. She's mad at me because he's in my spot and he's sitting where I'm supposed to sit. And my God, I wanted to just smack their heads together and just tell God I did him a favor. What's wrong with you? Who cares? Come on, is that right, Pastor Bill? Right? I mean, I'm telling you, I did it seven and a half years on both coasts. Listen, if you, the six years I pastored in New Jersey, that was, that was the tribulation. There's no tribulation coming. I went through the tribulation dealing with those East Coast people. My Lord, Jesus, set me free. Woo! And then in 96, when the Lord touched me through Rodney Howard Brown's ministry and the joy of the Lord filled me, I felt whew, all those years, all those years of fighting religion and I just was filled with joy I was filled with joy and I was around people that wanted the fire I wanted, they wanted the fire they didn't want to fight about the fire and how late will the fire go tonight it's like oh my god you know I mean one time I was in one church in New York one time I went to go minister and this guy walks in and goes what time does it get over I go dude you walked in you just got here you're not I said, just go home. You'll be more blessed. There's an old saying that religion is a man fishing, thinking about God. Right? Excuse me. Religion is a man in church thinking about fishing. Excuse me. A relationship is a man fishing, thinking about God. Right? Right? Praise God. So just all over the house, just lift your hands toward heaven. Father, thank you tonight for your presence. Thank you, Jesus. Your presence, Lord, is so awesome. Lord, we've seen you set the demonized free. Lord, we've seen you raise up people from the dead in our ministry. Lord, we've seen you touch people in marriages that had no chance just no chance in God you just did a miracle Lord again and again we saw blind eyes see and deaf ears hear and lame people rise and walk leaving their crutches and canes and wheelchairs Lord again and again your kingdom is in demonstration come on just stretch your heart right now just stretch your hunger toward the Lord tonight tonight he's saying this to all of us in January of 20. 21. He's saying this. Come out of your comfort. Come out of your village of comfort. Come out of your village of in entertainment. Come out of your village of self. And lay it all on the altar tonight. Just lay it all on the altar of Jesus. And just come follow him. Who knows what tomorrow will bring. 
It'll probably bring blind eyes seeing and deaf ears hearing. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. But it's not worth hanging on to comfort where your fears and depression rules. Tonight, if tonight you feel a tug in your heart and you just want to make that fresh commitment to the Lord, I'm not saying there's sin in your life. I'm just saying you feel that tug of the Lord saying, leave, leave the village of comfort. If that's you tonight, I want you to stand up boldly, quickly, just all over the house. Just the Spirit of God is just tugging you. It's easy to get into comfort. I know it is for me. It's easy to fall into comfort, right? I want you to just come find a place around the altar. We may lay hands on you and pray for you. We may not. But tonight, just lay it all on the altar tonight. Tonight, just make an altar, a 2021 altar to Jesus. A 2021 altar to Jesus. Put your kids on the altar. Put your parents on the altar. Put your career on the altar. Put your future on the altar. Put tomorrow on the altar. Put your sickness on the altar. Lord, I trust you. Just You tell the Lord, I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Jesus. I trust you, Jesus. I trust you. I don't want to live in Capernaum. I don't want to live in Capernaum. I don't want to live half-hearted, lukewarm. I don't want to live a lukewarm life in Capernaum of comfort. Jesus, tonight we just worship you. Come on, right now, just lift your hands toward heaven. Just begin to make an altar right where you are. Father, thank you, Jesus. God, we thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Some others of you, you're supposed to be down here. Come, come. No condemnation. No condemnation. It's not about sin in your life. It's just about leaving comfort. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, tonight we just worship you. We just worship you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. Just wait on the Lord. Let him touch you. Let him touch you with his fire. Let him touch you with his anointing. Let him touch that anger problem. Let him touch that depression. Let Jesus do something about it. <laughs> Let him touch that depression. Let that joy bubble out of your heart. Thank you, Lord. Leave the village of Capernaum. Leave the village of comfort. <laughs> 